Thank you very much, Peter, for uh, inviting me over today. Um, if I grow up, I will want to speak like Alan Mulally. I can tell you that. Amazing. Um, he does it right off the cuff, and uh, that is something we all aspire to. Um, I indeed will speak about Spiker today, uh, but I'm, uh, I will answer certainly some questions about SAR, Peter, but it is a, a bit of a problem that we're right smack in the middle of these negotiations, and it's going to be very difficult to uh, go into the details of that because it's very sensitive and still very much under negotiation. So I'll have to stick to, uh, to the Spiker story, although I'm sure that when we met uh, each other on the 30th of November in the Athletic Club here in Detroit and I just filed my first bid for Saab, uh, just two days later I saw, or so I got the invitation to speak here and there must be some connection with that submission of the bid and the fact I'm here, particularly if you come to think of it that this is a let's say a congress where Alan Mulally and Roger Pansky and Sergio Marchione speak and then Victor Muller. What, what name doesn't belong in this list? It's of course Marchione because he never wears a tie. But other than that, I can assure you that um, a small car manufacturer like Spiker is of course the odd one out. Um, Spiker, and I, uh, why would you say that it's embarrassment that I'm a lawyer? I, I started as a lawyer. I didn't know any better. Uh, I went to university. I learned the law and I actually became uh, an entrepreneur. And in that process, uh, I'd always been a tremendous car lover. I'm a real car guy, but not the car guy that you see usually in, in congresses like this. I'm not an engineer, uh, but I've become very uh, knowledgeable about the product over time. But uh, surely, I'm a passionate car guy, and, and that's really what set me out to start the Spiker company in the year 2000. We're actually 10 years old. Um, my speech today, is basically hinging on the, 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 the Congress is about what is required for the new era. And I think that the new era will require entrepreneurship, it will require brands, and it will require tenacity. Those are the three elements I think that I would like to focus on, and particularly against the backdrop of Spiker. Um, Spiker clearly is a brand, and the brand that we built over the past 10 years hinges on the five brand values. Um, heritage design, craftsmanship, performance, and exclusivity. And I would very much like to take you through those very briefly. Of course, time won't allow for an extensive uh, review of the brand. But I would, since this is the first time, and probably the last time, unless we actually manage to buy SAAP, that I'll ever be on this Congress, um, I would very much like to give you a little background about this beautiful brand, which started in 1875 when two brothers, Hendrikus and Jacobus Spiker, started a company in a city called Hilversum, just south of Amsterdam, and they started building coaches really at the top end of the market. Um, they were really very, very good at what they did, and they became actually suppliers to the Dutch royal court. In 1898, they supplied this fantastic masterpiece called the Golden Coach, and it's actually made of uh, plated gold. It's absolutely gorgeous. These guys are not dwarfs. This coach is just very huge. In 1898, Spiker also started manufacturing cars. And of course, we're talking about a very cold sanitation in this industry right now, you know, where companies are going out of business and so on. But in 1898, when Spiker started making its very first car, we see Hendrik Spiker here leaving the, uh, the gate um, with a one-cylinder Benz dog cart, basically. Uh, just the horse had just escaped, right? Um, this was an industry in the year 1900, where in Europe alone there were 4,000 car manufacturers, 4,000 of them. Look at where we are today. Spiker became a very innovative company. And although there are many companies today that claim four-wheel drive was their invention, unfortunately for them, there is only one real inventor of the four-wheel drive. It was Spiker. In 1903, they developed the first six-cylinder, 60-horsepower horse, car with a four-wheel drive, permanent four-wheel drive engine. And it was actually a Grand Prix racer. And it was capable of 60 miles an hour in 1903. There was absolutely nothing in those days that could, could achieve that. Uh, just to put the things in perspective, at Kitty Hawk, the Wright brothers put the flyer in the air and it did like 45 kilometers, 30 miles an hour. So this car was like the Bugatti Veyron of its age. In 1907, Spiker had really found out that racing was very um, uh, supportive of its brand. And so they participated in the Peking to Paris race um, from, um, from which Actually, Spiker came second. It was a very interesting race, and it showed tremendous tenacity to bring the car 13,000 miles home. And they were 
um, showcasing, I would say, which is known now as the first case of sport sponsoring. You see on the picture Louis Vuitton trunks and bags. This is why particularly our Chinese customers order a specific Spiker Louis Vuitton kit with every single car they order. In 1914, when the First World War, the Great War, started, the Netherlands were actually neutral. And, uh, but that didn't stop Spiker from starting to make benefit of the fact there was a war going because, then again, we're all Dutch, right? So we love to make a buck. Um, and Spiker, rather than Saab, was born from propeller planes. And this is where the logo, which was introduced in 1914, came from. It shows a beautiful propeller with a wire wheel and nulla tenazi in via script. It means, for the tenacious, no road is impossible. I can assure you one thing, if you are crazy enough to start a car company in the year 2000, and you're still here 10 years, 10 years later, and actually speaking at this Congress, you have to be tremendously tenacious. And that tenacity is something that the current industry, the current circumstances in the industry, demand. After the war, in 1919, Spiker did something quite unusual. They started building cars like aircraft. There was only one other company that did that. There was Vazin in France. They really built cars like aircraft too. But this car called Aerocoque was basically an aircraft with no wings, clipped off wings, closed wheels, fuselage, and even a, fan, a little fin tail. Spiker knew that the fin tail had basically no real aerodynamic value, but it was a design statement. We, Spiker, are aircraft manufacturers. Very important for the current cars. By 1922, Spiker broke the 24-hour record in England, and it was actually the swan song of the Spiker company, because in 1925, they went out of business in, um, in a voluntary liquidation. It was a very technologically driven company that had like 300 patents in their name at the time, but they had no home market. They basically had a tremendous small engineering capability, and um, it was just uh, too much for them to sustain their business. In the year 2000, I started the company again, together with my partners, and we created a wonderful team to set this business up from scratch. And we introduced, at the um, motor show in uh, Birmingham, in the year 2000, our very first car. It was just basically a trial out. Would anybody in his right mind want to order a super sports car from the Netherlands? And guess what? It did happen. And so this is the C8 Spider as we have made them now, basically since 2003. We're phasing them out this year in favor of the new aileron, and this is the coupe version of it, the La Violette. Jean Valentin La Violette actually was the young Belgian, 24-year-old Belgian engineer that developed this six-cylinder six four-wheel drive car as early as 1903. In order, initially, um, we funded the company ourselves, but in, 19, sorry, in 2004, I took the company public, and uh, we became a company in which everybody could participate, and that really helped, I must say, um, I thought it was a bright idea, no pun intended. It really helped to get um, third-party investors interested in the company, and it worked very well for us. We, we got, for instance, uh, the sovereign fund of uh, Abu Dhabi to take a stake in our company, and it really helped the credibility of a company like ours. One has to bear in mind that if you are entering a market segment in which, in principle, no one has successfully entered since Ferruccio Lamborghini put his money where his mouth had, was in 1963, you have a huge challenge ahead. It's not like no one tried. Since 1963, at least 150 attempts must have been made to challenge Ferrari. Surely, we're not challenging Ferrari. We just want to be a player in the supercar market. However, you have a lot of skepticism and well-funded skepticism ahead of you because most of these little dreams never materialize. And so I did basically, well, we, in fact, did three things in order to overcome that. First of all, I thought it was extremely important to create financial transparency, hence taking the company public. The second thing that we did is, was we thought that in order to have sufficient market share, a uh, market product in order to sustain the engineering cost to develop a product from scratch, we needed to be certified for the United States. I can assure you, if you are a foreigner and you try to bring a car in the United States and you're not a big OEM, it is the biggest challenge you can ever face. But we did it. We managed to get the company to the point that we brought the cars and since 2005 we're US certified for all of our cars. And the third one, which we felt was absolutely paramount for the, let's say, for the Spiker brand to develop, 
was racing, 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 racing. And we took the cars to Le Mans, and that has been a pivot of our marketing strategy ever since. This is the new Spyker C8 Aileron, the second generation car. Much stiffer chassis, all aluminum space frames, uh, a suspension developed by Lotus, and um, very consistent, let's say, in our aircraft-inspired design. We don't have a design department. In that sense, we are very low cost. I make the designs. We use them in all of the, all, everything that we do. So it's a very small company in that sense. We have like mm -hmm. 113 employees. This is the new Aileron Spider, uh, the rack top version of the coupe. And this car has the uh, logo Nuller Tanasian Via Svia on its body as a tribute to those who have worked for 10 years relentlessly, our team, to build these cars from scratch, truly from scratch. This car will come to the market in 2011. It's called the Peak into Paris as a, in honor of the um, race of 1907, and uh, it will be uh, powered with an American engine, actually. Here it is. Building the brand, in as far as I'm concerned, is everything if you start a small car company like ours. It's been a tremendous challenge to get some share of voice because you don't have the funds to do so. So racing is very important, but being there at the right events, showing your product, but particularly the quality of what you do, the quality of your product, or the bespokeness of your interiors, these are the things that you have to put a lot of attention to. And I think that we have carved out a place for ourselves in the market, although this year we'll make, like, say, like 100 cars. We're very, very small. One can only imagine that if we would indeed achieve acquiring Saab, what would mean to this company going to, let's say, 100,000 cars. But in any event, if you look at your positioning in the, um, what we call the brand arrows, this is where we want to be. We don't need to be the fastest in the market segment. We'll never beat the Bugatti Veyron at its own, own game, and, and certainly not the most practical. We want to be number one in style. People don't buy Spiker because they want to, to break the sound barrier. They want to arrive in style. They want to have a beautiful piece of um, automotive art, and that's really what the Spiker is all about. Right. Racing, I already mentioned it, is pretty pivotal for our marketing strategy. And I think there are two reasons particularly why we would do that. First of all, racing breeds the brand. If you look at where Ferrari is today and Lamborghini, there is no doubt that the major difference between the two is that Ferrari consistently has been racing. Everybody knows that Enzo Ferrari basically built his road cars to fund his race car ambitions and did so well in the process. Lamborghini made his road cars but really didn't race them so much. And they're both absolutely gorgeous brands, but I think that if you want to create credibility as a small car manufacturer, racing is absolutely the way to go. Another element is certainly, in the back in the 20s in this country, Stutz found out that they had showrooms filled with buyers on Monday mornings after winning the races with their bear cats. And it's absolutely true today that there is a direct correlation between your assault on the track and um, your sales in the showroom. Race on Sunday, sell on Monday. This year, after seven years of relentless efforts, we managed to achieve a fifth place in our class GT2 at Le Mans. This sounds like what, what are you so excited about, right? Fifth place. But if you bear in mind that we have beat every single Porsche at their own game with our own developed car, our own engines, entirely developed in-house, it really made me very proud. It was the highlight, I would say, of 2009. And for us, racing is becoming, let's say, the real driver behind our international sales efforts. We took that a little bit too far in 2006, and it's become uh, a, a classic case of how not to enter Formula One. Uh, we acquired a team of Midland, and we did that because we felt that if we could manage to keep the team running at basically zero cost, we would have entered the biggest um, marketing machine in the world. And definitely, I can assure you, that is certainly still the case today. A year and a half in Formula One, I can tell you one thing about that. Everything you think about Formula One is true times 10. And it is absolutely a stunning environment to be operating in. And I can assure you that if we had the opportunity, we would do it again in a heartbeat, but then properly. So where do we want to be in the next five years, next three years? We would very much, we're very much aspiring to being in the top of this market segment, this niche market segment of Ferrari, Aston Martin, Lamborghini, and particularly now Bentley, 
we've basically opened up this market segment tremendously with the introduction of the Continental GT a few years ago. We extend our model range this year with the uh, Aileron Spider and the uh, Peking to Paris in 2011, and we have to become profitable. Ten years into the game, having spent tremendous amounts of efforts, but also money, of our shareholders, and particularly of also my own funds, um, we still have to achieve that point. We're very close, we'll get there, but it comes to show how difficult it is to carve out your own little niche in this market segment and make money. Two days ago, Bob Lutz, I must say, I'm in tremendous regard for him, um, in particular uh, related to the case of Saab, said, how are you going to make a small fortune with Saab? By starting with a big one. And I must say, that was very encouraging, very encouraging. <laughs> Achieving sporting successes at Le Mans is definitely what we need to, uh, net, what that we're aspiring for in the next few years. And if it's the opportunities given to us, we would very much like to relaunch Saab. I thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I'll be glad to uh, answer any question. Thank you, Victor. Uh, you want to stand over there? Are, you're, are you're, you I'm, I'm too close oh, to you. Okay. All right. All right. I'm, if you have your personal space. Uh, yeah, I, my personal. No, that's all right. Let's come over. We can hug. Um, real quickly, what what is your price range? Uh, our cars start, let's say, from two hundred thousand dollars upwards to, let's say, two fifty. And how did the global financial collapse affect the the super the global supercar market in general, not just you? I think in general it's taken hit of, let's say, some forty percent, and uh, we have basically managed to escape that to some extent uh, because our customers are so wealthy that they're really not affected. The point is not whether they can actually buy one, afford to buy one, the point is do you want to buy one? If uh, thousands of your employees are uh, being let go, uh, when everybody is looking at non-conspicuous spending, will you actually spend $250,000 to buy a toy? And that is something that is now slightly subsiding. We can really see buyers coming back into the market. Uh, needless to say, says the questioner, your vehicles are extremely unique and with great styling. What's the attraction for you with Saab? Is it commonization, proliferation of model mix, distribution, or scale? Can you make money with Saab? That's a lot of questions. That's there. a lot of questions. Um, but I, I guess the, the central question is, why do you want to have Saab? <laughs> I think that, um, first of all, Saab is, in my view, an iconic brand. And if you look at what's needed for the future, the, the way I see it, entrepreneurship uh, brands and tenacity, I think Saab would fit in very well with a phenomenal brand. Um, there has been conducted a tremendous um, business plan execution, uh, an investigation for Saab. And that business plan clearly shows that Saab, of course, having sufficient um, sales, it can be a very, very sustainable and profitable company. So that's the reason why we're interested. We're not interested just to buy into an iconic brand. We're interested because it, as a business, should be viable. Um, why would we be interested from a spiker point of view, spiker cars point of view? Well, I think that uh, one should not overestimate the opportunities that a 100 car per year car company and a 100,000 year car per year company can have at the same time. But you do have to bear in mind that we're currently spending tens and tens of millions of euros every year in research and development for our product, product development. Those monies go outside of our company. If we would be under the same roof, spiker and Saab, all these funds would be spent in-house. That's one. The second reason, which is very attractive, is that there are 1,100 uh, Saab dealers worldwide. Now, it took me and took us uh, some 10 years to generate 40 dealers. It's really quite hard. And um, mainly Lamborghini and Bentley dealers currently worldwide. But among these 1,100 Saab dealers, I guess, my rough guess is that there are 10% of them that would be very eligible to become Spiker dealers. And that would basically triple our, uh, our infrastructure for uh, selling spikers over time, particularly with the new models that are coming up, which will be slightly more highly f volume driven. Having a better distribution on the back of Saab would be something that is really attractive. Thirdly, um, the uh, engineering capabilities of Saab in-house will definitely enhance the spiker products. And, and finally, uh, there is the, the, the Saab parts bin, 
Um, a, a car consists of two and a half thousand parts, many of which will never be seen by anyone. Yeah. And it will be absolutely ideal if you can buy them. If you buy one or produce 100,000 cars a year, it's going to be so much cheaper than when you buy, make only 100. W would you be one corporation? Uh, definitely, definitely Spiker and Saab would be subsidiaries of what would be called Saab, Spiker, Automobiles, NV, a Dutch uh, public, limited, public uh, company. Uh, at one point in the not so distant past, Saab sold as many as 50,000 units in the U.S. If you end up buying the company, what will you do to restore the luster to a brand that has been undermarketed and undervalued for many years? I think. Let, let me elaborate on that. If GM lost money for most of the almost all the, the last 20 years on it, how can you make money on it? I think that Saab is a brand which has proven to have the most loyal following in the uh, automotive world. Which means that in the event that you give these potential loyal followers the product that they want, which is a Saab product, and I think that if anything has gone, uh, let's say, wrong, if you will, in the past 20 years, is that Saab has lost its own DNA to some extent. And people were interested in buying a Saab Saab, not a Opel Saab, for instance. Which is, I mean, Opel, fantastic brand, super quality of product, and I'm definitely sure that the Saab company as such has had tremendous benefits by being associated, a subsidiary of GM. But the buyers, the Saab buyers, if they wanted to buy an Opel, they would have bought an Opel, right? And, and they wanted to buy a Saab. And so I think that over time, Saab has lost so much of its DNA that its customers just couldn't identify anymore with the Saab product, and that has caused its decline. I think if you manage to turn that around, which it will be a matter of a few years, I mean, it's, it's not like you can do that overnight, but if I look at the new 9.5, um, as it's going into production right now, that is an absolutely stunning design, and it's a car with total Saab DNA, in spite of it being built on the platform of the Opel Insignia. The next generation, 9.3, will be a Saab-developed car. And I think that will be a unique opportunity to recoup those customers that have left the brand over, the, over time because they could no longer identify themselves with the brand. Uh, broadly speaking, what, what's <coughs> the, the financing proposal that you bring to it? Ed Whitaker says, you know, give us the money and we'll sell you Saab. Right. right. He, 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 uh, he, I he, saw he, that. So um, where's, where's your money come from and, and what's the Russian connection? Uh, I, I don't think I'm at liberty to go into uh, the way in which we fund the transaction, how it's structured. Uh, that would be uh, absolutely in the interest of the transaction. Uh, what I can tell you is that we have shown Mr. Winokur the money. Well, actually, th this was going to be my last question. So I oh, there you go. Make my, no, wait. I will make my last. I've been getting emails for the last three weeks from distraught Saab dealers. You gotta help us save this deal. GM is not acting in good faith and, and so forth. What, why is GM shutting it down and appears to be on the road of not selling Saab but shutting it down? Uh, first of all, I disagree with you that they're on the, not on the road of selling Saab. Uh, uh, and the last time I looked, uh, which is about a half an hour ago, we were still in the middle of the process. That doesn't mean too much, but anything can happen. But uh, we're absolutely, definitely negotiating in good faith with GM to buy Saab. And I, um, I can understand very well that the outside world perceives certain actions as being directed towards a, a wind down. I mean, clearly there are steps toward a wind down. But I mean, Mr. Whitaker has been very clear about that on the 18th of December. They said, listen, we're now going into wind down mode and we will consider offers. They are considering offers very, very seriously. Um, so I, I am not that concerned about all these steps that are being taken for this wind down because they are consistent with the decision that they took on the 18th. It's my job to reverse that decision and make sure that Saab is indeed saved. And it's very heartwarming to see all this uh, let's say these actions taken by Saab owners and Saab dealers and, uh, and aficionados of the brand that really are striving toward it being saved. And in reply to your question, why would GM want to do it? And I think 
also Bob Lutz has been very clear about that. It, if the, the sale of Saab doesn't generate more than the wind down scenario costs, for them it is clearly not attractive. So it was my job, our job as Spiker, to put forward a, pro a, a proposal that is attractive enough for them to reverse that decision. And we're right smack in the middle of it. These are exciting times. Best of luck with your bidding. Congratulations on Spiker. Victor Thank Miller. You. We will now take a break, and we'll be back at 4 o'clock sharp with what's going to be a very lively uh, retail discussion, given all the things going on in the industry. See you back at 4.